Thank you for your attendance today. My name is Scott Clements with Community Associations Institute. We go by the acronym CAI. CAI is a not-for-profit professional association dedicated to the betterment of community association living. Founded in 1973, CAI currently has over 40,000 members in 60 chapters. CAI membership is comprised of individual associations or homeowners, HOAs as they're known, and the elected members who govern them. The service providers who provide management assistance, financial, legal consulting, contracting, and property maintenance services. We have over 1,500 members in, Cal in, excuse me, in our Orange County chapter, which is the state's largest. The crown jewel of our education program is known as the CLTP, the Community Leadership Training Program. It's a multi-part program that has sections on law, insurance, contracting, maintenance, and reserves. The program is taught by some of the most experienced professionals in the industry and is considered the gold standard for HOA education. The challenge for the folks in the real estate industry is the full CLTP is 12 hours long and over multiple days. So we condense the program, leaving just the information that a real estate agent would need to know, not the full program, which teaches one how to govern and manage associations. So if you live in an association, and particularly if you are on a board of directors for an association, we encourage you to sign up for the next full CLTP at the Orange County website, caioc.org. This program is just going to focus on the things that the realtors need to know to help in the transaction process. Um, CII has been providing these courses since 2019. We've been excited about the program. It actually won an award at National for our outreach to the community. And we certainly welcome new members, but we want you to know that we have a lot of resources available for non-members. So for instance, our magazine is afraid, <clears throat> available free on site with no paywall. You can also sign up for a number of programs. And most importantly, our service directory is free. So if you have a question about an association and you want legal advice, financial advice, contractors, or et cetera, there's over a thousand people on that website that specifically work with HOAs. And again, that's all available, no charge. <clears throat> so with that, I'll get rolling from <clears throat> our program and then I'm gonna introduce our first speaker. I put this Easton versus Strasburger site up there just to remind you folks of a couple things. One, in Easton Strasburger, they weren't accused of being corrupt, they were accused of being lazy. So as we talk about the circumstances related to an HOA, it's different because, of course, that was related to the physical condition of the property. As it relates to an HOA, well, of course, your clients can see that. What we want to focus on today is talking about the documentation, of course, the legal, the operational, and financial information that people will really need to make a decision as part of an HOA versus a single family home or other type of real estate investment. <clears throat> what we want to do today is make sure that you understand how to make an effort to ensure your clients have copies of all the relevant information, the CCNRs, governing documents, et cetera. And we're going to talk about methodologies, how to get that. And we want to make sure that you have your clients understand the policies, the usage of their properties. And again, how you get that information and how it gets conveyed to your client. And then, of course, we want to make sure that you work with your clients so that they understand the financial condition of their property, including the operating and the reserve funds. And then, of course, that your clients understand their insurance needs. HOAs are required by law to have insurance. We have a section on that later. But, of course, your clients are going to want to have their own insurance to protect their own interests. So we're going to talk about how to work with those individuals to determine what it is they need specifically for themselves. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Constance Trin. She's been with the program, uh, I think, since its inception. She is the chairman or the um, uh, chair, co-chair of the Education Committee in Orange County, a well-respected attorney with uh, Whitney Petchel. And she's one of the few, I believe, in the industry. Her parents are realtors. So she is one that knows a lot about it because she grew up in the industry. And I think that's why she volunteers her time. And we thank her for that. So with Constance, I will turn that over to you. Thank you so much, Scott. That was far too kind. Um, but yes, my parents uh, put me through college and a little bit of law school, um, you know, as, as real estate professionals. So it's really quite an honor for me to um, present to you today. Um, so let's get to it. We're going to talk a little bit about law. All right. So common interest developments. Um, so what we should understand about a common interest development, I mean, exactly what is it, right? Um, it, it means that there's some... Uh, relevant of some common ownership or some shared element that is shared amongst the homeowners. So when we're talking about a common interest development, um, really it describes a, a certain type of real estate and a form of home ownership. And there's no really, you know, structural type 
or architectural type or standard size for a common interest development. Uh, sometimes they are um, attached condos, kind of like the picture that we have here that's pretty common for what we understand to be a condominium. Um, sometimes they're townhouses or sometimes they are uh, 10 units and sometimes there are 30,000 units. Uh, so they really, they can be uh, single family detached homes, uh, multi-story high rises. There's really no one size fits all. Uh, but despite the wide range of differences that might exist among common interest developments, they're all similar in that they, they allow individual owners some use of common property, right? So like I said earlier, what does common mean? It means there's some shared component. And what that shared component is really depends on the type of, <clears throat> of, of common interest development that we're talking about. So the first one that we have here is the condominium. <clears throat> and I think that's probably one that most of us are, are familiar with as far as shared ownership, because <clears throat> just structurally looking at it, you're going to have shared walls, shared entrances, shared areas. So in a con condominium, generally the owner will own the airspace located between the interior surfaces of a residence within a building, um, as well as some undivided interest in the common area. So when we're talking about someone owns a condo in a, in a perhaps an attached structure, they will basically own everything from the walls in. So from the unfinished wall, meaning they're responsible for painting, wallpaper, whatever it is that they do within the confines of that airspace is their condominium unit and their maintenance obligation. Um, and I might say generally a lot, and it's I'm not trying to dodge it, uh, but it just basically means that it, it, these are are general principles, um, but ultimately it's going to dial down to um, and be dependent on what your specific ownership or your specific community is like. Um, and the way you can kind of tell, because like I said, you, you sometimes can't just tell by looking at a particular um, <clears throat> structure and decide whether that's a condo or a single family residence. Um, the easiest way to um, figure that out is to look actually at the legal description that's in the grant deed. Okay, so within the legal description of a grant deed, let's say, for example, you have a 48 unit development on Main Street. And you're looking at it and you're like, oh, I don't know, is this a this is a condo? What you'll see from the legal description is that the owner of that unit might, would have something that would say a grant deed showing that they own unit eight plus one forty eighth undivided ownership interest in the common area. So when you're looking at um, the grant deed for a particular property, that will really give you um, the best answer as far as whether or not what type of development that you are in. All right, so a plan development. Uh, this is a legal form of ownership where each owner owns his or her own lot and the residential structure that's on that lot, right? So this is um, what you commonly will see in a development where the owner owns the ground uh, that their home is on and that's on that lot. Uh, in the plan development, most often the common area, right? The common ownership that we're discussing is usually gonna be streets. It might be open space. It might be recreational facilities. Um, it all depends, but uh, that's usually what it's going to be for a planned development. Okay, and then we also have some lesser known uh, common interest developments that are probably not as popular here um, in California, and those are um, community apartment projects as well as stock cooperatives. Uh, in a community apartment project, um, the homeowner has the right to occupy a specific home within the community uh, apartment project or the right to occupy a particular unit and some use of the common area. So it's very similar to a condo. Um, it's just called something different and might be structured differently. Um, same thing with the stock cooperative. These are very common in, you know, back east. Um, in a stock cooperative, the a corporation owns the entire real property and the homeowner um, doesn't get a deed, but they actually get a share of stock in the corporation tied to a specific uh, home or unit that they they have the right to occupy. All right, so I know I'm talking to real estate professionals here. So, you know, a lot of times when I'm <clears throat> looking at my local listings or whatnot, I see a lot of, uh, you know, ads for things like townhouses. And townhouse is not a legal form of ownership, okay? Um, it 
it might be a, a marketing term. It might mean something to the person who wrote it, uh, but it doesn't necessarily mean something legally. A townhouse could probably uh, can be a condo of there's maybe there's shared walls, but it also could be a single family residence if it's freestanding. Um, a lot of things I all see are, are also single family attached and think single family detached. Those are also not legal forms of ownership. Um, they can either be condominiums or in planned developments. Again, if you want to know exactly what kind of uh, <clears throat> development it is, look at the legal description and that should tell you what it is. All right, so sources of legal authority regarding common interest developments. All right, so uh, just a little bit of history. Um, common interest developments really became popular in the 1960s and 70s. Um, as a result of, you know, sustained demand for new housing, which really started um, since the end of World War II. Um, at that time, you know, we had troops coming home and they were marrying their sweethearts and getting ready to start a family and they wanted to establish roots and buy a home. So as that continued to, that con demand continued to grow, um, you know, it's hard to believe that in the 60s, 70s that there was a... <clears throat> less land there is today, but, you know, there was climbing land prices and really population growth that really decreased the amount of cheap land in which um, they could make uh, single family homes um, affordable. So at the same time, we also had shrinking local revenues for infrastructure. So common interest became very popular with developers and city officials. Um, developers wanted to be able to increase property density um, in order to make housing more affordable to buyers, uh, maybe make more money. Um, and at the same time, local governments wanted to avoid the costs of new infrastructure that they would be required to um, put in place, such as streets, right, <clears throat> and parks. Um, that would be associated with increased um, density and development. So as a result of common interest increasing, problems started to arise with poor construction, improper funding, really a lack of regulation on how um, common interest developments were managed. So as a result, in 1984, the Davis-Sterling Act was enacted. Um, and really the Davis-Sterling Act covers a lot of the law of how um, community associations operate. Um, it describes uh, maintenance obligations, um, assessments, um, insurance limits and requirements, um, how to handle construction defect claims, how members vote, what members are entitled to. Um, you know, a lot of it also is, is a sunshine law in this in the respect that um, members should be able to see how their homeowners association is run, what their financials look like, how the money is spent. Um, how board meetings are run, how members are disciplined. And really, you know, when I look at my old CCNRs for my, my older communities, you know, I have one that was, um, that started in 1969. And the CCNRs in that community consists of, you know, 18 pages. Okay, 18 pages, and it doesn't really tell me a lot about what, what's allowed and what's not allowed, you know, versus compared to <clears throat> my newer developments, um, you know, developments that are new today. I mean, those CCNRs are, could be upwards of 200, 250 pages. And it, you'd think, wow, you know, it's it's been 50 years of, you know, things that have happened, wrongs that have happened, that have really um, made developers really incorporate a lot more into their CCNRs. And so for our older um, developments, um, and even some of our new, the Davis-Sterling Act helps fill in those gaps. Um, and sometimes what you'll see is, they'll say, okay, well, the civil code says this, and the CCNRs say something a little bit different. So when we're looking at both of those sources of authority, you know, sometimes the civil code will say shall, and you know, what does that mean? Shall means that it's mandatory, they must do it. Um, sometimes the Davis-Sterling Act will also say, you know, uh, shall unless your governing documents say otherwise, in which case the default would be what your CCNRs say. Okay, so we have here the, uh, oh, sorry. We had, Scott had up the uh, Condominium Blue, Blue Book, uh, which is not necessarily a source of authority, but it has the sources of authority within that book. So you'll have the Davis-Sterling Act, you'll have um, the vehicle codes, corporation codes, which we'll talk about in a little bit, but um, that's all in there. And um, it'll be a, a very exciting read if you wanna pick one up. I'm sure Scott can tell you where you can get a copy. All right, so Corporations Code. 
Um, most corporations or most associations in California are formed as um, a California nonprofit mutual benefit corporation. Uh, so before the, the Davis Sterling Act, um, Corporations Code really described how the association operated. Um, but now with the Davis Sterling Act, um, the Civil Code really is going to be governing how association elections and votings, voting issues are, are done. Um, that said, Corporations Code still fills in some gaps um, just because um, the associations or most homeowners associations as corporations are still subject to the requirements of the Corporations Code. Okay, vehicle code. <clears throat> All right. So common interest developments have the right to tow vehicles. Um, there are certain conditions that have to be met. Um, but uh, if the association has either private streets or private motor courts, they have the authority to tow from those areas. Um, uh, as the owner of those, those um, areas, they have the right to establish rules and say who can park there and how long they can park there. So, you know, when you're representing a buyer, um, they should really understand that uh, they can't just park everywhere, right? So a lot of times what I find is, you know, we have a, a family and they have five drivers and they move into a community where there's over no overnight parking. So that means they're going to have to have two cars in the garage, maybe, right? Two cars on the driveway, if that's available. And then they'll have one extra car. And maybe the rules for that association will say, okay, we'll give you a parking permit because you have five drivers in your home and we'll let you park here. But in some communities, they're saying, sorry, there's no overnight parking on our streets. Uh, you park the amount of cars that you are available to have, and you're going to have to park your fifth car off site. So that can be um, a rude awakening for some homeowners who don't understand that they're moving into a homeowners association who will have uh, established parking rules. Um, and if it's their, their property um, under the vehicle code, they can tow. So that's that's a, a pitfall that you should look out when you're um, helping your respective clients find a home. All right, so then we have health and safety code, which sometimes comes up. Um, you know, the statutes um, prohibit um, associations from uh, not allowing daycare centers to operate within associations. Uh, that comes up here and there. It hasn't really bothered very many people, but um, just that's something that sometimes comes up. All right, federal laws. Okay, so <clears throat> generally speaking, homeowners associations are not subject to the ADA unless they are places of public accommodation. Uh, sometimes those are gonna be, uh, for example, if there's a private pool, but perhaps they open it to the public for, I don't know, swim team or swim meets, that might create a trigger that it might be a place of public accommodation that would require uh, associations to comply with the ADA Act, um, the American with Disabilities Act. Um, but more often what I see is the Fair Housing Amendments Act. So a lot of times we'll have homeowners who will come in and they may require a reasonable accommodation in order to enjoy their home. So what we have seen is, for example, um, you know, most recently I had a homeowner purchase a, um, a it was a single family residence and they had to um, install basically an elevator lift in order for them to access uh, their second floor from the outside. And, you know, obviously that's probably not within the design guidelines of what a homeowner can do. However, um, a reasonable accommodation had to be made for this particular homeowner under the um, fair housing. And so we had to do that. And, you know, that doesn't necessarily mean that any and all accommodations have to be met. They just have to be reasonable. So, um, you know, if you're, you have a client who has specific needs, you know, I would probably look into that to make sure that this is a place that whatever it is that they need, um, you know, to meet their needs, that this is something that would be um, allowed within this community. All right, we all, sorry, we also have the bankruptcy code. Uh, sometimes we have homeowners who don't pay their assessments and this can be an issue. So there are um, mechanisms in order to pursue liens and judgments against homeowners who don't uh, pay their assessments. However, uh, the bankruptcy code is also in place. So, you know, we, we want to make sure we don't trip over our own stick when associations don't follow the rules. 
Uh, same thing with the, uh, the Federal Debt Collection Practices Act, um, FDCPA. I'd read that in conjunction with the bankruptcy code as well when it pertains to collection of judgments. All right, case law. So <clears throat> case law is basically um, it's interpretation of a law based on specific set of facts, which um, may afford, affect board decisions and associations when faced with the similar situations. Um, basically, these are legal decisions rendered by the California courts. So they may not necessarily be codified within a statute, but because they are established case law, um, it's the associations are still subject to them. All right, governing documents. So your governing documents of an association are going to include the articles of incorporation, um, if there are corporations, so that's applicable, um, CCNRs, bylaws, subdivision map, or a condominium plan, um, the operating rules which govern the common interest development, and uh, they'll also define the rights and obligations of the common interest development and its members. Um, these are basically all the govern all the documents that govern how the association should run. All right, so the CCNRs. These, uh, the CCNRs are a recorded document uh, that contain, among other things, the ground rules for the operations of the association. Um, they're going to identify the association's common areas and their responsibilities, uh, explain the obligations of the association to collect assessments, most likely, um, as well as the obligation for homeowners to pay their assessments. Um, it also states that associations may sue owners for violations of the rules or failure to pay assessments and explains what happens if there is any kind of destruction of property in the development um, in the result of fire or, or an earthquake. Um, the CCNRs will also contain the basic rights and obligations of the owners. Um, they can be amended by a vote of the membership. So if you have a buyer who's looking to purchase in, within a community and there's a particular CCNR provision that they do not like uh, and think, well, we'll just have that amended. I'm just giving you a warning now. It's a very tall order. Uh, probably one of the problems with homeowners associations when it comes to you know, membership votes is there is an overwhelming amount of apathy. And you know when we have our, well, today's actually election day. So we'll have, you know, uh, a, an elect annual election for our association that elects our, our board of directors and we won't even be able to get you know 15 percent of the community to show up a lot of times when it comes to a ccnr amendment it's going to require a super majority so 67 percent of the community has to approve it which is um unless you're selling something that everyone really really wants uh usually something that will save them money uh it's it's very difficult to achieve uh, so the CCNRs, so, you know, no one forces you to read the CCNRs, um, but it is recorded against the property, and it's presumed that your, your buyer is knows the information. Uh, they're on notice. Um, maybe they get it, maybe they don't, but it doesn't matter. They can't be, be ignorant of it. Um, it's presumed that they are aware and that they are going to be subject to it. You, you know, I, you have no idea how many times I hear from homeowners who are like, well, I didn't know, or I didn't understand, or I, I didn't realize that, you know, this was an architecturally controlled community. You know, I, I can't paint my house purple, you know, so I get that a lot. Um, unfortunately, regardless of whether or not the homeowner has read their CCNRs, they're going to be uh, subject to um, the rules within them. Okay, so next we have the condo plan. So the condo plan is recorded within uh, the county recorder's office prior to even construction of the condominium product project. Um, it's gonna show, if you look at this picture here that Scott put here, it's gonna show usually the engineering specifications of the project. Uh, it's gonna have the descriptions and diagrams um, really identifying, identifying the boundaries of the separate interests. Um, or units, as well as going to depict what the common areas are and where the exclusive use common areas are, such as parking spaces or maybe balconies for any particular unit. Um, a lot of times these, I'll look at a condo plan and it'll help me, you know, clarify what the members' respective maintenance responsibilities are um, as compared to the associations. However, sometimes they lend clarity and sometimes, unfortunately, they're still not clear. So we have the <coughs> final subdivision. This is the track map. So this is going to be for a planned development. And it's going to show the lots and the common area dimensions for a particular um, development. So when we're looking at the slide here, the picture on the right, 
it's going to you're going to see a lot of boxes rectangular boxes those are um just just from looking at it from here um those look like those are the individual lots for the picture particular property if you look here this there's a large um upper left hand corner there's a large open space area that probably is going to be a lettered lot, meaning it's probably a lot A or B or C. And um, you can tell that's gonna be probably common area. Uh, the streets here might also have lettered lots. And if they do, they are also likely private streets that are owned by the association um, as compared to the numbered lots, like lot one, two, three, four, five, um, that surround it uh, that are most likely um, individual separate interests for each homeowner. Okay. Oh, sorry. Sorry, Scott, one more. Um, a lot of times these um, track maps will also depict utilities and public rights of way um, or emergency access vehicle rights. So you'll see within these, you know, it'll draw out a line that says, you know, um, emergency access vehicle easement, which means, you know, it's got to stay clear. So, you know, a fire truck can come in or if there is a utility easement, it means that the you know, water company can come in and has the right to enter this area and either install their, I don't know, utility pipes and things um, in that area, or it means that they may be able to enter the property and perform some kind of maintenance. All right, articles of incorporation. So um, again, uh, you know, if, if your homeowners association is a corporation, they'll have an articles of incorporation. Um, you know, these are usually maybe only a couple pages long. Uh, they don't really say very much. They're filed at the state level. Um, um, usually it'll it's a document that'll identify the association as a corporation and what type of corporation. A lot of times when I look at this, it's only in order to get the official name of the particular homeowners association. So sometimes you'll have, you know, a community that's commonly known as, you know, for example, well, there's one in South County, Las Flores. Well, Las Flores is not the name of the official corporate name of that particular community. It's actually LF Maintenance Corporation, which, you know, is probably a harder sell and less sexy. So people call it Las Flores. But, um, so if I need to know what the actual corporate name is for the community in order to either draft their contract or look up information about the entity, um, I look at the articles of incorporation. All right, so the bylaws. Um, in almost every instance, an association um, through its board is, is run through its board of directors, and they have the ultimate responsibility for managing the association. So the bylaws are usually not recorded, but sometimes I see them attached to CCNRs. Um, so as a corporation, bylaws will establish the rules by which the corporation has to be run. Um, it usually sets forth how members should vote, um, the number and the term limits for the members of the board of directors, the duties of the board of directors, as well as the duties of the officers. Um, it will also set forth um, member discipline rights and vote rights. So it'll say something like, you know, before a homeowner um, it has can be subject to any kind of penalty, um, you know, they have to be invited to an enforcement hearing and be provided with at least 10 days or sometimes 30 days uh, notice of that hearing. And then they have the right to attend that hearing and talk to the board about whatever that enforcement um, violate, alleged violation would be. Um, bylaws are, like I said, are not usually recorded, um, but they can also be amended by a vote of the members um, at a general membership meeting. Um, again, tall order. Uh, if, you know, if, Unless the bylaws are, are being amended in order for the and, and the community is selling something that homeowners want, it's really going to be very difficult to amend the bylaws. All right, rules and regulations. So, in addition to the CCNRs, the bylaws, the Davis Sterling Act, associations also have the right to adopt operating rules regarding a variety of subjects such as parking, architectural guidelines, and facilities use. So they have the ability to establish rules to say how, what, what time the pool is available, how a homeowner may reserve a clubhouse facility, um, where they can park, how long they can park. Um, so these rules and regulations do have to be written. Uh, they cannot conflict with state law or other governing documents. Um, they are passed uh, after it's actually a 28 day notice now requirement where um, as they post the rules, 
so that homeowners and residents can see, oh, okay, well, this is the proposed rule and they have 28 days to comment. And then the board can adopt that rule uh, after 28 days and then post the notice that it has been adopted within 15 days after um, it has been uh, adopted. Uh, you know, I always recommend that for, for our real estate professionals here, you know, if it hasn't been made clear, homeowners associations have a lot of rules. Okay, there are a lot of rules in living within a, an association. And, you know, whenever I have, you know, dinner with my friends from law school and they're like, oh, you, you represent the evil homeowners association, you know, because, you know, when we were in school, we learned, you know, your home is your kingdom and you are, you are the king and you could do whatever it is with your property. Um, unfortunately, that's not necessarily true with home. when you live in a homeowners association, uh, I, I like to kind of couch it as it's a right that you give up, but a benefit that you purchase. Uh, you know, I'll tell you in my last home, I had a neighbor who never mowed his lawn, never painted his house, had cars up on blocks and just uh, a basketball hoop out in front of their house at all the time. And it drove me insane. Uh, and there was really nothing I could do about it because I didn't live in a homeowners association. So when you live in a homeowners association, at least you have, you know, that you have this collective effort that is going to make sure that your homeowners, your neighbors um, adhere to the same rules that you promised and they promised uh, in purchasing with a community. And, you know, one of the ones that comes up a lot is, you know, and this came up recently, you know, a lot of his homeowners associations have rules that prohibit, you know, RV parking within the community. And then I have a homeowner who buys within the community and they're like, well, I have this RV, you know, I parked, a, I, I bought this lot because there's this huge uh, open space next to me and I can park my RV there and it'll be great. Well, unfortunately, that's not allowed. Okay. And it's not even just, you know, something that happened in a recent community here in Huntington Beach is they, um, they didn't just have like a giant RV that, you know, like a mobile home or anything like that. They actually had this very nice uh, Sprinter van that they probably had invested a hundred thousand dollars in because, you know, they loved spending their weekends camping and doing all this stuff. And so it was a conversion van um, that was an RV that had hookups and it was also their daily driver. Uh, unfortunately, that was not allowed in this community, right? So they they had to either park it in their garage, but it didn't fit, or they had to park it off site. So after a long battle, they ended up having to buy a second vehicle and parking their converted Sprinter van RV off site somewhere else. So, um, you know, that was really a rude awakening for them as well. So when you're, you know, representing your buyer and they're saying, you know, these are my needs for my home, you know, they look at a home and say, this is great. I love it. I got to have it. But, you know, we also got to explore, you know, what are your needs? What are you, how many vehicles do you have? Is this the right community for you? Um, just so that, you know, after close of escrow, they don't find themselves in a situation where they are regretting uh, that they bought into a community with so many rules. All right. So enforcement. So when you have a lot of rules, you got to enforce your rules. <laughs> so each association's board is going to adopt a set of procedures and guidelines regarding the enforcement of rules and regulations of their CCNRs. Um, sometimes this procedure is set forth within the bylaws and the CCNRs. If not, it's going to be in the Davis Sterling Act. Um, and, you know, there is going to be usually a, a fine structure or a, an enforcement process. And a lot of times, you know, It'll be, okay, hey, we noticed that your house needs some painting. Here's a courtesy notice. Um, please paint your house within the next 60 days. And then we have a homeowner who doesn't paint their house. And then they have, um, you know, the first en enforcement hearing, and then a second, and a third, and a fourth, and a fifth. You know, and every association is going to have a schedule of fines. Sometimes they're $50. And sometimes in a higher community, because fifty dollars, uh, most homeowners will just pay to violate. Um, they will have to have increased fines, and so it might be a thousand dollars a month if you have a really high end community. So, for example, I had um, a home where there the rules specifically stated that you had to install your front and rear yard landscape within one year of close of escrow, and one year passes, we send them the courtesy letter and we say, "Hey, could you please?" Um, you please, uh, you know, um, install your landscape. You know, these are what the CCNR say, and they refused to do it, or for whatever reason, did not. Um, and so we had to invite them to an enforcement hearing, and we gave them probably 
two and a half years, two and a half years each month, we find them a thousand dollars in order to get them to install their landscape. So despite, let's say 12, 24, 36, $40,000 worth of fines, they still did not do that. And, you know, when I, in my communities, I don't like to go to court until at least I can say to a judge and to a jury, because I know that we're already going to be disfavored as the faceless, evil, tyrannical homeowners association, that we've tried everything in our power to get them to comply before we actually have to seek court intervention. So, you know, homeowners will go through that enforcement process. Scott, you want to go to the next slide? Yes. You know, like I said, we're going to have hearings um, and we're going to assess fines. Um, next slide. And sometimes we'll have to go through internal dispute resolution. Um, and that really is just a, um, it's known as informally as a meet and confer. And what it is, is it's just um, the association, one board member from the association is gonna be appointed to speak with the homeowner and where they have a sit down, they have a discussion about what the dispute is to see if they can try to resolve it. And, um, you know, really the purpose of this statute is to get homeowners to neighbors to speak to each other to see if they can resolve things um, before further escalating. escalating. Uh, when a homeowner requests for IDR, the association is compelled to participate, uh, but not the other way around. And then if that doesn't work, we have to escalate to ADR, which is Alternative Dispute Resolution. Um, it's, it's a precursor to litigation. Um, the davis Sterling Act actually specific says that before you can pursue a cause of action for breach of the governing documents, you have to participate in ADR. Um, primarily, we see mediations. Um, arbitration is sometimes the next step. Um, sometimes it's a lateral step, but it's very infrequent that I see arbitration. Um, Okay, and in an arbitration, basically someone who acts like a judge makes the decision. Uh, there are certainly pros and cons to them. Sometimes it's more, it's faster, um, but it's certainly more expensive. Um, in that same community, we actually pursued arbitration because it was a, an architectural dispute. These people wanted to sell their $30 million home. And so they did not want to have this tied up in court for four or five years. Uh, time was very, they were very, it was very time sensitive. And so as a result, we actually went through arbitration which we, you know, cost tens of thousands of dollars, but it was completed within, you know, I think it was nine months that we were able to complete and resolve the issue. Um, that's something that might've cost, that might've taken years within the court system, um, but obviously cost much more. All right, so <clears throat> as I was saying earlier, we had that homeowner who refused to install their landscape and we find them every single month, uh, you know, almost, $40,000. So when we pursue the, we ultimately pursue a lawsuit. So what an association will generally get is a restraining order that either prevents them from doing something, right? Or we have a preliminary or permanent injunction, which compels them to do something. And in our case, it was compelling them to install their landscape. Um, damages, we were able to collect the $40,000 in, in fines that we had assessed over the past two years, two and a half years. Uh, trying to get them to install their landscape. And then ultimately, unfortunately, the next slide, the driving force behind all, all of this is usually going to be legal fees. Those darn lawyers. So what we had in that particular case is we had, uh, we got a judgment that required the homeowners to install their landscape, right? So these were $5 million homes where people were putting in I know, spending half a million dollars to a million dollars on their landscape. So these people had to ultimately put in their landscape. They had to pay the $40,000 in fines, right, damages. And ultimately, they paid $100,000 in our attorney's fees because it took that much. It took us going through years of enforcement, you know, IDR, ADR, going through a lawsuit, going to trial um, in order to get them and compel them to do what they had to do under the CCNRs. So... So if you have homeowners who think they can just break the rules, I'm just saying, don't do it in one of my communities. All right. And then enforcement, there are some defenses to enforcement. Um, uh, you know, a lot of times what we'll get is we'll pursue um, a lawsuit for breach of governing documents. And these are the types of defenses that the other side will come up with. Um, then next. All right, so standards of care. So you're now thinking, oh my gosh, 
what a pain. Who would ever want to serve on the board of directors for a homeowners association? You're always the bad guy, right? You're always chasing down people doing, uh, getting them to do right. So board members um, are protected under the business judgment rule. And this is probably every board member's favorite rule is because it protects them from personal liability for decisions made while they are serving on the board. Um, board members are not held to a perfect standard. Um, they don't need to act, they do need to act professionally and they need to confidently run the affairs of the association. So on every board, you know, you might have uh, different types of professionals. You might have a nurse or a teacher, but they might not necessarily be, uh, you know, asphalt or roofing experts. And so what they can do is they can um, rely on their consultants and that would protect them. Um, from personal liabilities, you know, see these board members are volunteers and where they don't have a specific expertise, they're required under the business judgment rule to make a reasonable inquiry and get advice to help make a wise decision. Sometimes that means relying on legal counsel or maybe their accountant or maybe their management company uh, who will help them, um, who have the expertise in order to help them to make the right decision. Um, so in order to be protected under the business judgment rule, um, the directors have to act in good faith. It means they have an honest belief in confronting the facts and sharing those facts with the, the parties involved, right? So there's no um, secret dealings. Um, so after reasonable inquiry and or investigation, so like I said, they don't necessarily have to be experts in every field, but they have to ask the questions that surround the decision so that they can make an informed um so they can act on an informed basis. Um, and they have to act in the best interest of the community. So directors have to place the interests of the needs of the association higher than their own. So nobody wants to ever pay higher, you know, um, assessments or even a special assessments. But when we're looking at what the needs of the community are, maybe that is required, right? So when we're looking at when boards delay in making necessary repairs or push off assessments or increases, um, you know, it might look to a judge or a jury that they're putting their own interests um, in lower assessments first. Okay, Scott, I think that's all I have here. Yeah, next to our, we include these so that they have the information because this is, of course, extremely important to the real estate community about the documents that are available. And that's the one question that we've had. And again, we invite people to ask your questions. Some we may pause and answer live, others we may respond to. But this is the information that's available to the membership. You see I've highlighted some of the areas here. And so this is to let you know what your you know, requirements are, or the requirements of the HOA as to information that we can give to, of course, the seller. Understand that the HOA has no relationship with a potential purchaser, so they owe them nothing. And that's the other reason, and I think it's in a slide or two here, that the civil code um, dictates that the seller is responsible for the monies as it relates to purchasing items through escrow. And we're going to talk about that in a second. And that's because, again, the HOA can fine or charge the uh, seller because they have financial control where they have no relationship with it. So it always has to work through there. Obviously, the buyer can pay them back as part of the transaction, but it has to roll through the seller because of the relationship between the seller and the HOA. And I know that we hear a lot of complaints in the industry about the charges that you have for these documents. And I'm going to go, there's a whole list of them here, um, but you can see them. It's in the civil code 42, uh, 4525. And for those that want it, just type in me, please, um, or send me an email. And I'm going to um, give you my email address. I have a copy of the Davis Sterling Act in a PDF format that I'll be happy to share with those that want it. And it has a lot of information that you don't care about, about 100 pages or so, but probably 20 or 30 pages that you would care a lot about. And it's section 45, 25, and the subsequent. So there's a lot of information that can be gleaned from the homeowner that the homeowner gets. We're going to talk about it in a little bit with the um, financial section, but there's a document that's called the annual disclosure package in our industry. And it puts out, you know, all of their policies, procedures, et cetera. So most anything that a consumer would want to know is included in that. The challenge with that is, of course, most people throw it away. The other aspect, it becomes dated very quickly. These are all pro forma. So when we're anticipating our expenses and our opportunities and what we're going to need in the way of the policies and procedures, they can be changed. As Constance mentioned, you know, if you don't like the parking, well, hey, a group of homeowners can convince the other group of homeowners to change that. And so now the documents that were valid four months ago are no longer valid. 
So it's important from a risk management standpoint to make sure that you're working with the most current documents. And so, yes, I know it's expensive, but you've probably heard this before. That's the price of selling real estate in California. So compliance with all these disclosures is a benefit to the consumer. And it's, of course, a benefit to the real estate industry because it removes that liability. As you know, we started talking about what should you do? Um, I don't think that any real estate professional, and Constance can disagree with me if she wants, but I don't think any real estate professional wants to sit down and start going through the bylaws or even the rules and regulations with their homeowners. Make sure that they're aware that they exist. Ensure that they get a copy of them, even if it has to come through the big package. Make sure they get a copy of them and ask them a question or two about it. Did you read it? Do you have any questions? And if they do, caioc.org. As I mentioned, we've got literally hundreds, hundreds of vendors that will be able to answer questions about CCNRs, about financial statements, about reserve studies, all kinds of policies, procedures that you shouldn't know about and that you shouldn't try to know about. You can direct them to the people that will know about this. Um, so that would be my advice is yes, make sure that the sellers do get all of the documentations and that they... Um, Ensure their clients do their best to read them as best as possible, because uh, we're going to talk about this more in the financial section. It really benefits everybody involved to make an informed decision, because um, I, I know Constance was talking here about the parking, seeing this a lot, commercial vehicles. You know, a guy's a plumber, he has his commercial vehicle. A lot of HOAs don't allow overnight parking of commercial vehicles anywhere on the site. So unless you can fit that into your garage, if you have a garage, you're not going to be able to park your work truck. And in California, as you know, that's a really important issue. So it's important that they clearly understand what their rights and responsibilities are before making all of these very important disclosure decisions. Yeah. And, you know, and from a legal perspective, I mean, how do we protect ourselves here, you know, whether you're the buyer or the seller or the broker in between? Disclosure. OK, so it's the best money that they will spend in order to protect either parties, because you can say, I have disclosed this to you. And, you know, and they when they someone says, well, I didn't know, it's like, well, I gave it to you with the information. So, you know, it's, it's like something else we get a lot, you know, that comes up is um, aside from parking is, you know, white houses with black trim are all the rage right now. And everyone wants to have a white house with black trim. And there's nothing wrong with them. They I, I like them, too. But I'm going to tell you is that we have these you know communities in Newport Coast that have this uh, Mediterranean Tuscan theme and someone moves in and then they're mad that they can't have a white house with black trim so you know when you're when you're you know prospective buyer or you're 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 representing a buyer in the community and that's what they're saying that they want it's like okay well understand that this is an architecturally controlled community and you have to go through a process and get approval for what you want and the overall theme here is Tuscan Mediterranean and your white farmhouse, modern farmhouse is probably not going to work. So, uh, and that's come up for me in many, many communities. So uh, that's just something else that might help you with your, uh, with your clients in the future. Okay. Other questions for Constance before we let her go off and do what she does so well? Oh, I see here it says, um, so Joyce had a question, where are the bylaws available to homeowners if not attached to the CCNRs? So again, as Scott was saying, you know, there, the homeowners association doesn't have an obligation to produce that to any prospective buyer. However, if you request that of your seller, that's something they're going to have to produce. And maybe they have to buy it, or maybe they've held on to it after all these years. Uh, they can give you their dusty copy, but um, it will be within the disclosure package as well. And again, you know, they don't change very often. So there's a pretty good chance that the one that they got last January or, or so is still valid. But if you're in the middle of a sales transaction, we recommend that you get all the updated documents, even though, of course, it's an expensive process. All right. Well, again, Constance, thank you very much for appreciate your uh, enthusiasm and your information. <laughs> thank you, everyone. Take care. Okay. All right, next talk, I want to talk about insurance. Uh, as we've talked about before, it is required. So I'm going to go through some of that. The questions are, okay, why do we buy insurance? And then more importantly, what factors determine the specific insurance that we're going to buy? Well, one, as we've talked about, the davis Sturing Act requires that you uh, do that. And for those that are looking at the uh, questions, I typed in my email, scott at Reserve Studies, Inc. Just simply send me an email and I will send you a copy of the davis Sturing Act in PDF. So that has all the laws relative to homeowners associations here in the state of California. So that's going to be the first level. 
And then, of course, the governing documents, the CCNRs. And then, of course, lenders are going to have their own requirements as it relates to insurance, and that will vary literally by lender and, of course, the specific loan. So there's all kinds of requirements onto the insurance of specifically what you will buy. So the davis Sterling Act requires a couple kinds of insurance. The first one that you see over here on the left is the liability for the volunteers. As Constance spoke about, you know, these are volunteers, they're donating their time, there's no compensation, there's no reward. As, as any of you who have served on a board know, um, there's a lot of grief sometimes, a lot of angriness. So they want to make sure that these people are financially protected. So if somebody's going to sue the board, the HOA uh, and the board of directors, that each of these individual board of directors has insurance so that they personally can't be held liable. We could get into great details where that could be penetrated, et cetera. But for the most part, homeowners association board members, if they act in good faith, are immune from prosecution. However, they will have the defense. And if they're found to be negligent, then there would be damages. So an association has to have at least $500,000 worth of policy or um, uh, coverage if they are 100 or less units. And if they're 100 or more units or 101, they have to have a million dollars of liability insurance for their officers and directors, commonly called DNO insurance. They also must have general liability insurance, generally property owners insurance. For those that live in a single family home, you have a similar policy. This is just to cover anything that can go wrong with the particular property. And again, limitations are set. Um, and these are minimums. If you want to go above this, certainly you can. But the minimum of $2 million, if you are 100 or fewer uh, associations, if you're 101 or more than 100, it's $3 million. So you see, there's always going to be some insurances for these types of things. And then there are a whole bunch of riders that we're going to talk about in just a moment. The other required coverage that was added a few years ago is a fidelity bond coverage. Uh, unfortunately, the um, HOA industry, and this is nationwide, has an unfortunate history of embezzlement. Um, as I think Constance mentioned earlier, uh, the number one contributor to this is apathy. A lot of the members are just, they pay their associations, they never look at the documents, they never pay attention to the financials, they just pay their money. So it's a group that isn't um, as diligent as most corporations would be, therefore making itself more susceptible to these kinds of crimes. So they put in fidelity bond coverage so that if an employee, uh, a vendor, uh, a member, if somebody has uh, absconded or embezzled from the association, there's coverage for that. So in a dishonesty bond or an honesty bond, as they call them, is also required by an association. Other types of insurance, the um, insurance article may be based on the um, articles of incorporation, ownership interest. Constant talked about this earlier. There's a big difference between a condo and a PUD, so the insurance requirements would be very different for each of these ownership groups. So in talking to your insurance professional, you're going to want to have to know that information up front. If you're looking at property and you want to get a quote on insurance, you're going to need to know the legal entity. Is it a condominium, a planned unit development, a stock cooperative? You see there we have that townhouse association, as uh, Constance mentioned. That's not a legal term. So a lot of people see a townhouse and they say, okay, that's a condo. It may be a condominium, that's possible. It also may be a PUD, a planned unit development. So a townhouse, generally speaking, is an architectural term that denotes that they have at least one shared wall, but that nobody's atop them, right? That would be considered an apartment building. So when you start hearing names of, you know, townhouse association, et cetera, that doesn't have anything to do with its legal entity and would have no value as it retains to the insurance and getting that. So you want to know what your legal definition is before you start talking specifically. Same thing with stock cooperatives, et cetera. They have a legal definition. So you want to make sure that your insurance matches that specifically. And of course, it's going to vary by maintenance and repair obligations, right? So if the association has, for instance, an equestrian center, well, they're going to need to have coverage specifically for that equestrian center. If they have pools, et cetera, they're going to need these. So the insurance obligations are going to vary by each community. As we always say, each community is unique. Each circumstance is unique. So you have to review that specifically to understand what the HOA and more specifically what the owners are going to need. Uh, as we all know in this industry, there's a lot of lender insurance requirements. Um, they will vary by the lender and the loan specifically, so you can do with that with each detail. So for HOAs, you got property insurance, and that's first-party damages. So that's a loss to the name insured. So you know we got Boca del Vista Phase Five. Thank you, Seinfeld fans, for getting that. And so that's the entity that's the named insured. So when they suffer a loss, they're doing. And that's a, what we call a fortuitous loss, sudden and unforeseen. So it doesn't cover things that you anticipate, things that you ignore, uh, but things that happen suddenly. So like a fire, flood, et cetera. Uh, there's also third party and injury. So if somebody was on your property and they were damaged, that would include it. it includes hurt feelings. Um, and, but there is a need for negligence. 
So for instance, if there's a board meeting and uh, a member disclosed uh, in front of everybody uh, or a board member disclosed in front of everybody that unit B was in arrears, they had not paid their assessments. Well, that's a violation of some bankruptcy laws, fair debt collection action laws, et cetera. So that would cause hurt feelings. And there's also negligence in that because they shouldn't have done that. But on the other hand, if the person had just said, you know, um, the, you know, their yard is, is worn down and we've got a, a fine letter, that's a whole different scenario because your hurt feelings are because of the truth and everybody knew the truth. It wasn't information that was secret or shouldn't have been disclosed. It was public knowledge. So there has to be a need for negligence in order for these policies to pay. Various forms. So typically have a special form or a master insurance policy, and that's going to cover the other items and then other additional insurance, such as a fire insurance, fidelity crime insurance, earthquake insurance. Um, those that have been doing this for a long time know that earthquake insurance was relatively affordable right up until, I'll say, 1994. Uh, and then it became very expensive. Um, so now many associations choose to what we could just call self-insure, which just means they try and build up their reserves um, or have a lot of money or um, other means to take care of it. But uh, insurance is still quite costly for earthquake, particularly in some specific areas. Um, you've probably heard about flood insurance over the years. And then now another one is becoming fire. Uh, if you have not known, fire insurance has increased anywhere from 10 to 20% to 400%, depending on where you live and your circumstances. So it's a big issue going on now. You're having a lot of non-renewals. There's carriers that are leaving the marketplace. So fire insurance is more difficult to come by and may soon fall into the categories of earthquake insurance. Typically, it's known as walls in coverage. And we're talking about a condominium here because in a condominium, as I think Constance mentioned, you own the walls in. So you own the paint or the wallpaper or whatever you put on those walls. The drywall and the studs behind it is what the association does. So from a walls in coverage, the association is only going to cover the drywall and in. So inside the unit, whether you have personal paintings, furniture, et cetera, that's all going to be covered by your insurance. It won't be covered by the HOA. So it will defer to the CCNR. So whatever is required in the CCNRs is required in the insurance. So no more, no less. So if it doesn't have any other coverage, it's just going to be that very bare walls, as it talks about, which is the HOA up to including unfinished surface spaces. So yes, if something happens to the property, fire, flood, damage, et cetera, they'll rebuild the walls, they'll re-pipe um, uh, it, they'll put new electrical in, whatever is necessary to bring it back. But once you get inside your unit, those individual fixtures, your plumbing fixtures, your light fixtures, your carpeting, your flooring, et cetera, those aren't really covered. There's also known as single entity, uh, and that's the builder specifications or equivalent. So it's walls in, but excludes upgrades. So if you've included special, um, let's say hypothetically, you put in a, an arbor, you got a nice wood arbor on the back patio of your porch, well, oh, that's an upgrade. So the association's insurance is not going to cover that in the event it becomes damaged. You would have to have that covered under your own policy. And then there is the quote, all included. And that's everything in the building that if you shook it upside down and everything came out. So that would, of course, all the personal belongings, et cetera, that wouldn't be covered, but it would include all, all the things that are permanently attached. So your light fixtures, your flooring, if you have wallpaper or paint, all of those things that wouldn't come out of the building if you shook it upside down, that would be an all included policy. And again, each association will determine what they want. And so it's important for the um, individual purchasers of units to know what the association has so that they can purchase to their own desirability. Um, also, it's sub, uh, susceptible to the or subject to the deductible and policy limits. Um, so we're talking about this in a second. I see Sabrina's on there ready to rock. We're going to talk about finances in a second, but this is a good reason why it's a smart idea for HOAs to have some money, okay? Because we're in California, flood, fire, earthquake, they all happen, and the HOA is going to have a deductible. And they're often quite large, sometimes half a million or a million dollars for a large community. So if the HOA doesn't have that particular amount of money, well, they have to go to their membership to collect it. So it's a good idea to have insurance deductibles, uh, at least those amounts in your reserves or in other financial uh, capabilities. And then of course, it's also subject to policy limits. So if you have a million dollars in coverage, well, everything above that million dollar in damages is gonna be on the app of the HOA. And so we ask that question, how is it different from what's known in the industry as an HOA six or the homeowner's policy? So an HOA-6 is generally defined for a condominium unit, and again, that's the walls in, where an HO-3 is designed for single-family home. So in that instance, the homeowner is going to be responsible for the framing, the structure, et cetera. So their liability, of course, is much different, which is why they have the different policies. So you're going to have the building property, the improvements, 
also HOA deductibles. So if the HOA suffers a loss and they special assess the membership for that loss because they don't have enough in reserves, well, then you can get that coverage under your HOA deductible with your own HO policy. Uh, personal property. So again, you can get policies that if you have, for instance, uh, you know, a $10,000 fish tank in your unit, it becomes damaged. Well, again, HOA policy is not going to cover that. So your personal property would be covered under your HO3 or your HO6. Personal liability, dog bites somebody in your unit, your dog bites somebody in your unit. Loss of use. So the building catches on fire and it's got to be rebuilt. Okay, well, you've got to live somewhere in the meantime. So if you have to rent an apartment for 90 days while they rebuild your home, well, then it covers that loss of use and will cover your rent at another property. Loss assessment. So again, you um, have to pay a special assessment, wasn't covered they have a loss assessment. And then we talk about excuse me, comprehensive auto insurance in there. Many association policies have limited auto uh, coverage, meaning if an auto is damaged, but for the most part, it's the automobile that must be covered. So unless the building collapses on that automobile, most likely you'd wanna make sure that you have comprehensive automobile. So for instance, if your car gets broken into in the HOA parking lot, that's not covered under the HOA policy, that's covered under the auto insurance policy. Uh, fidelity and crime, it's for employee theft. And you see that employee is in parentheses because, uh, or in quotations, uh, because there's a lot of people that be considered employee. Anybody who's working on behalf of the association particularly is an employee. So for instance, you have a board of directors. If it was a board member who embezzled, they would be considered an employee. If you had a committee member, a finance committee member that was involved in the embezzlement. If you had a management employee, if you had um, other vendors, uh, your bookkeeper, CPA, what would include is, for instance, you have your property at B of A and a B of A employee stole your money. Well, no, that's B of A's problem. They would have insurance for that. So it's just an employee of the association, but anybody working on behalf of them. Uh, other insurance agreements would come into play. So there might be coverage and other policies. They also have a social engineering and deception and fraud. You probably heard about that. Of course, it's an election day. We've heard a lot about disinformation and so forth. So for instance, if somebody were um, to have a, a case against the uh, uh, association for disseminating false information, making false advertisements, et cetera, that would be included in there. Now, the limits are set in the Davis Sterling Act. You see 5806 talks about the limits. We talk, spoke of those earlier. You'll also see some in the CCNRs. Generally speaking, CCNRs will just often mirror the Davis Sterling Act. So if you're required to do something by the Davis Sterling Act, the CCNRs usually just mirror that. However, you can also have some increases. So the CCNRs can go uh, above and beyond the Davis Sterling Act. And then of course, lender guidelines, and those are set individually by each individual lender. The liability insurance, so the third party claims, bodily injury, property damage, personal advertising injury, uh, products or completed operations, medical expenses, um, auto liability we spoke about, talked about directors and lab, uh, officers liability they're required to keep. Uh, most associations, particularly the larger ones, they're gonna have an umbrella policy. So again, hypothetically, you have the minimum, you have a two or 3,000 or two or three uh, million dollar policy, and you know, you're a high-end community, you're worried about that. Well, you can buy another million dollars or $5 million, whatever you want, in excess coverage for relatively inexpensive. So the amount of coverage for that second million is going to be much, much less than that first million because it could, the odds are that you're not going to dig into that second million. But if it does happen, it's there. So a lot of them will typically have umbrella coverages that provide extra coverage on all of their policies, again, up to a certain limit. Workers' compensation is also included. Uh, we're going to have a slide on that. Talks about why it's important for HOAs, cyber liability, as we spoke about, and employment practices liability. So again, if you've got somebody who's employed by the association, you know, a, a utility uh, member, a staff member, uh, maintenance personnel, again, you're all subject to those employment practices. So you want coverage for that as well for, you know, um, uh, hazardous work environment, hostile work environment, et cetera. Additional insured, so they'll often require that the homeowners themselves be named. In addition to, of course, the HOA that a member would be named. Um, some people, uh, vendors and so forth, will ask to have disclosures back and forth and indemnifications back and forth. It's going to name the community manager. So in almost all circumstances, the community manager's contract with the HOA is going to require them to indemnify them, right? So you're going to have to cover your managers. Again, the DNO coverage and fidelity crime. Uh, the DNO insurance, that's for wrongful acts. As we talked about earlier, you have to show negligence. So if the board was doing something 
that they should have done and somebody was upset about it and they sue, okay, the insurance is of course going to cover the defense of that, but you're not gonna have um, a, uh, a payment unless there's damages that they can show uh, were for a wrongful act or negligence. Claims made is important because that often means the claim has to be made while there's coverage there. So if you had say for instance insurance in 2020 and your insurance lapsed in 2021 and you had a claim in 2022, for an occurrence in 2020 when you're insured, guess what? You don't have any coverage because your policy is not in place. So it's claims made, you gotta have a, a policy. Now you can buy a tail for that. So if you have a policy that ends, you could say, yeah, I buy a tail coverage. So it will now cover everything moving forward and it will also cover back policies. So you can get that coverage through a claims made or a, a tail policy. Uh, coverage differs greatly from policy to policy. As I mentioned, you can go off of one policy to another. So quote unquote, you had insurance and you still have insurance. There could be significant differences between those two types of insurances and the coverage made. So you always wanna have those examined very closely before you move from one policy to another. As I mentioned, fire insurance is becoming really expensive. Um, so a lot of associations are changing their fire coverage. They're either increasing their deductibles, lowering their coverage, um, other assessment issues. So um, that's something that can be done, but you wanna make sure to have those policies reviewed thoroughly to be sure that your individual homeowners are covered as needed. Workers' compensation, we get this guy, why do I have workers' compensation? We don't have any employees. Well, actually you do have. The civil code says that people working on your behalf would be considered employees. So while we certainly don't recommend that you have board members or community members going out there performing tasks, right? That's what you hire professionals for. But let's say you've got a, a board member and he's decided he's going to clean the gutters on the community and save him that $500 from that company. Okay. Well, now he's acting as a behalf on the employee. So if he were to fall off his ladder and hurt himself, he's going to have a worker's compensation claim and the HOA would be considered the employee. There's also a very famous case uh, about employees of vendors. The one uh, association, they had a service contractor uh, and they, um, I forgot what their specialty was, but it wasn't trimming trees. And so uh, one of his employees was up trimming a tree, fell out of the tree, injured himself. Well, it turned out that that particular vendor didn't have insurance to begin with, let alone the insurance that would cover that particular activity. So with no insurance, the association was left holding the bag. So they considered the employee of a service provider who was working on their property to be an employee. So that's why associations have workers' compensation, because virtually anybody working on behalf of the association can be considered an employee. Some will require it by their CCNR language. Um, of course, there's a lot of complexity with state employment laws on who would be covered and so forth. So it's important to have this coverage just to make sure that you don't have any outstanding liability. Uh, and then I just mentioned some examples of the past there where many associations have been held responsible uh, for workers' compensation, uh, even though they didn't have a physical employee. Uh, so I see a question, what type of HOA insurance uh, for a PUD property? That is an HOA3 policy. All right, so with that, I'm going to introduce you to Sabrina Davidian. Um, she has been in the community management business, I will say, longer than she wants me to announce, but I will tell you it has at least two digits in that number. She's very experienced. She's worked in portfolio, where that means she's managed multiple properties at one time. She also has experience as an on-site, managing a large property on-site and facilitating all of the maintenance that goes on with those what we call giant properties of hundreds of members. So she has a great deal of experience here in beautiful Orange County and has spoken at, I'll say, I don't know, a dozen programs within the last few years and received high praise and actually won an award from CAI for her performances. So with that, I give you Sabrina Davidian of Powerstone Property Management. Thank you, Scott. Um, I appreciate that introduction. Um, definitely talked me up there. Um, so thank you all for coming today. Um, it, I, I'm sure Scott has already mentioned it, but it means a lot to us in the management industry when you guys have a desire to learn um, about this. And finance is definitely one of those areas where you want to make sure that your clients are informed before they make one of the largest investments of their lives. And so um, because we're, our time is limited, We'll just jump straight into it. Um, so for today, we're going to discuss um, budget preparation, financial reports, legal requirements regarding financials, and then board duties. Um, 
So as far as board duties, the board has a duty to levy and collect assessments according to Civil Code 5600. And specifically, Civil Code 5600 says that the association has to levy regular and special assessments sufficient to perform its obligation. And um, that word sufficient is really important there. And I know your clients, when they're buying into an HOA, they're very concerned about the HOA dues, particularly about the HOA dues staying low and affordable. Um, and I, I think it's a common misconception that the health of your community is tied to your dues staying low. However, unfortunately, um, that is not the case. Um, the health of your community is really tied to your association bringing in enough finances to offset its obligation. So what does that mean? It means that you do have to increase dues to account for things like inflation, things like minimum wage increases. So it's a sad reality that it, dues increases are inevitable at some point or another for a community association. And it's up to the board to make sure they're levying enough to offset their obligation. Um, and so, and then another thing too, is the duty, uh, there is a duty of the entire board to manage the HOA's finances, even though the management company and the treasurer will often take the brunt of this role. Um, all directors really do need to have a working knowledge of their association's finances so they can make sure that the management company and the treasurer are doing their role, they're catching anything that may slip through the cracks. And so um, essentially there's more eyes and ears on it and we have a checks and balances system. All right, so moving on, how do we make sure, uh, oh, we're going into basic financial statement. Um, so the basic financial statements are comprised of several reports. Uh, the uh, popular reports or the most common reports you'll see there um, are the balance sheet, the income and expense report, the check register, the general ledger detail, and then the reconciliation report. Um, so the balance sheet. So what is that? So um, as its name states, it's um, a balance sheet. So what does that mean? You have assets and you have liabilities, and then the difference between the two, you're looking at your equity. Um, Scott, I'm not sure if I have a different presentation than the one we have here, because mine's in a slightly different order. Is okay. the next slide on balance sheet? Oh, okay, I'm sorry, we can go back. Um, <clears throat> all right, so um, assets, what does this include? This includes your association cash, the, um, the money in its checking account, its savings accounts, um, any sort of fixed asset. And then you have um, your liabilities. Liabilities are things like your accounts payable, expenses that you have incurred but not paid yet, um, things like your insurance premiums, for example. And then um, you have your income and expense report. Um, this is one of the most important reports. You really see where the association's money is coming in, where it's going out. Often in that income and expense report, you'll see a variance report. Um, that way you can see where the association is maybe running over budget, under budget, how it's performing um, basically in comparison to its expectation. Um, next, you have the check register. Very simply, it just lists the checks that are being cut out of your operating and reserve accounts. Um, it's important to keep an eye on those as um, a board member. And so then next we have the general ledger detail that just goes into um, additional, uh, it really, it's a more detailed view than I think you guys would ever necessarily need, but it goes into detail about exactly where that money is coming in and out of, um, whether it's to landscape, is it going to pool maintenance, uh, exactly where that is going. And then you have your reconciliation report. This lets you um, compare your bank balances um, to your financial statements and to make sure that all of that is matching up. And then next we have uh, general, um, your general journal entry reports, your prepaid reports and your delinquent reports. Um, of these, I think the delinquency report is really important um, for realtors to take a look at. It's kind of alarming when you have an association where the delinquency rate is over 10%. It's telling you that there, there's something wrong there and then the health of the association may be compromised because it's not bringing in enough dues um, it, per its anticipating in the budget. 
So that's going to result in some problems later on. Um, also, it may impact things like VA approval, FHA approval, if the association's delinquency rate goes too high. So we want to keep an eye on that. So moving on, um, we have the annual budget, understanding the, uh, um, the budget. So uh, the need, we have to look at the needs, policies, and goals of the HOA for the fiscal year, the anticipated income, anticipated expenses, and reserve fund allocation. So Scott's going to go into reserve fund allocations a little later on, and uh, it's an incredibly important piece of your association's finances, because essentially what you are doing is you're setting aside the money. So when that item or component within your community comes due for replacement, the money is there um, to fund that capital project. And so um, what that means is looking at your reserves regularly, and making sure that you are following the reserve analyst recommendations as closely as possible. And that's in a very important piece of your association's budget. That is typically where I start when I'm building the budget for my communities, is we look at that. And then from there, we plug in all the operating expenses because we have a little bit more room there as far as um, what we can or cannot cut out as far as discretionary expenses. Um, when it comes to your reserves, those aren't very discretionary. Um, when something breaks, you are going to have to fix it. You are going to have to maintain your community. Um, so what must be in the operating budget? Um, you have to have your estimated revenue and expenses. Um, estimated revenue include, includes everything like clubhouse income to your dues to late charges. Um, and then that is always done on an accrual basis, at least if you want to follow civil code and um, the general accounting, uh, generally accepted accounting principles. And then you have your expenses. Um, and then that, that's where you're typically looking at things like your utility rates, your monthly contract rates. You're looking at prior year spendings on extras to determine what you're going to need in the future. Um, and so you want to take a very close look at that every single year to make sure we are bringing in enough money for the community. All right. Um, so what are the limits as far as budget increases? And this is something your clients may have some anxiety um, regarding, you know, especially in today's economy with everything going up, they may ask you, you know, well, how much can I expect my dues to go up? And the answer is the board always wants to keep dues as low as possible. They are dues paying members just like every other homeowner in the community. Um, but when a dues increase is necessary, it is important to implement those. And the board's authority is to go no more than 20% of the budget. Um, so they cannot increase dues more than 20% without membership approval. Um, they can certainly do more than that, but it's going to have to go out to vote. So that may give your clients some peace of mind knowing that at any point that there's going to be a huge dues increase, they're going to get a say in that. Um, that being said, 20% can still be a very sizable increase, especially for some of these associations that already have dues in the couple hundred dollar range. And uh, so that, that is something to keep an eye on. Uh, one thing that's really important, too, is to make sure that your association is reserving properly. And Scott will go into that because if you're not, you're, uh, if you do not, your chances for a special assessment increase tremendously. And as much as a dues increase sucks, there is nothing worse than an unanticipated bill coming in your mail. Nothing bothers homeowners more than that unexpected fat special assessment. Um, so make sure that the reserve fund is um, being adequately funded, that the budget is enough to offset expenses so you don't have a special assessment. Um, but if there is a special assessment, again, um, it might give your clients some peace of mind knowing that they'll have a say in that as well. Um, the board cannot implement a special assessment more than 5% of the budgeted gross expenses for the current fiscal year um, without the homeowner's approval. Anything beyond that's going to have to go out to a vote. Um, and then you have emergency special assessments, and these are unlimited. Um, that being said, the word emergency is not to be used loosely. Um, an emergency special assessment can be something like um, a fire, a, um, a natural act basically causing damage in your community, 
um, raising the need for basically an immediate assessment to repair or replace that component. Um, there are things that homeowners can get on their insurance policies that will help with special assessment coverage. So that's something that can also give them some peace of mind when you're talking to them, um, is letting them know that they can talk to their insurance agent and get coverage for unexpected special assessments from their association. All right, next we have borrowing from reserves. So what happens when your association does not budget correctly? Your board is not looking at their finances and they're not saving um, enough to replace components. There may become a, a, a time where you know, your pool needs to be replaced. The plaster is damaged. The rebar underneath the pool is corroding and now you have to fix it, but you haven't saved enough money. So what can you do? Um, Civil code does allow you to borrow from reserves. Um, you can borrow for uh, up to 12 months as long as you disclose that repayment plan to the community. Um, that being said, it is a red flag that there is something going on in terms of poor fiscal planning. So that is something to look out for in terms of the, um, the documents when your uh, client is looking at buying in an HOA or is going through escrow. Um, you do want to make sure that they are bringing in enough money so you don't have to borrow from reserves, but that option is there if your community does need it. All right, next we have the annual reports that go out to your uh, community. So um, this is part of the escrow package that will typically be requested from an association. Um, you'll have your annual policy statement. This usually is mailed out at the same time as your budget. Um, it includes all the disclosures regarding um, ADR procedures, internal dispute resolution procedures, um, the collection procedures, um, fine and enforcement procedures, basically everything, the know-how for the community, um, and then as well as the budget. And so that's really important to take a look at before your client closes escrow. Um, so in addition, oh, uh, and then one thing that's really important to mention is the timeline. These do have to be mailed um, no less than 30, no more than 90 days before the end of the fiscal year. And the reason why this is so important is that if the budget in particular is not mailed within that time frame, the board and the association loses its authority to implement a dues increase. So it's so important to meet that timeline so the board doesn't lose that very important um, ability in order to um, adjust its dues. And then, uh, so, and then we have our year end financial reports, otherwise known as the audits. Um, so an audit is required when the gross, uh, sorry, not an uh, audit, it's a financial review, I should um, specify. There is a, um, a distinction between the two, um, but a financial review is required when the gross income exceeds 75,000. Uh, this does need to be performed by a certified public accountant. And uh, the difference between a review and an audit is just that an audit is a lot more detailed. Um, the CPA will go through the records with a fine tooth comb and they end up uh, they, in their, uh, what they produce for the association is a final opinion as to whether or not all of the association's records conform to the generally accepted accounting principles and whether or not any fraud is suspected. Um, so that's a really good assurance for your clients, um, for homeowners, that their association's financials are in order. Okay, so if next. you have any more questions for Sabrina, please put them into the, the chat box. She'll stay here for a moment longer to answer them. And while you're there, I have typed in my address, scott at reservestudiesinc.com. If you send me an email asking for a copy of the Davis Sterling Act, I will give that to you happily because it's very important information. And as you see from the first part of this process, there's a lot of information that would be good to know, particularly as it relates to the documents and their availability. So with that, Sabrina, thank you very much for your educational and informative section. We look forward to seeing you again. Thank you. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about maintenance and contracting. It's very, very limited for your needs. Just understand there's a big difference between the operating expenses Sabrina just talked about and the reserve expense, which we're gonna talk about in just a moment. 
And so we've talked about this briefly, but the board has a fiduciary duty. We've talked about that. It has a fiduciary duty to maintain the aesthetic integrity of the community. So if a board member failed to do that or a group of board members failed to do that, there is significant liability for that outline in both the Corporations Code and the Davis Sturdian Act. So of course, plan ahead and maintain your facilities. All right. So the reserve section. And that I say, I think the most important. I know I'm completely biased in that. But this is really what happens because um, this is where the association's financial health comes into play because most of them are relatively financially healthy in their operating budget because that's an annual basis. But if they fall behind for a number of years, they fall heavily behind. And if they play uh, safe throughout the term, they will. And we're going to show you how to look at that and how to instruct your members to look at that. So a reserve is made up of two parts. It's the physical analysis and the financial analysis. So the physical being what's there present at the property and the financial analysis is what's the money, the money coming in, the money going out, et cetera. So they're required They have a component inventory, which stays relatively stable from year to year, right? They have the same number of buildings, the same number of pools, water heaters, et cetera. However, the condition assessment will necessarily change, right? It's a year older or it's been replaced and it's brand new. So that condition assessment will change every year. And of course, the life and evaluation. So the life will just simply be elapsed by the number of years that have gone by. And of course, the evaluations will adjust to today's market rate. And as you've probably experienced in your own lives, the cost of replacing these components has significantly increased over the last couple of years. So what was estimated just two years ago um, is probably at some point um, significantly to moderately above what the anticipated is, because unfortunately for the HOA world, inflation has not been consistent. You hear these six and eight numbers on the CPI, and that's fine. Um, you know, that's the loaf of bread and all that. But it's hyperinflation on many different components. So for some people, um, particularly any concrete items, you're looking at 130 to 150 percent inflation over a couple of years ago. On elevator components, sometimes you're looking at a 200 percent increase on some of these component parts. So some it's high ultra inflation and others it's lower. So there's no way to really calculate that. That's why you want to get an adjustment every year based on that year's current cost. And then we'll inflate them later as we'll show you. It requires a couple of financial analysis, and one is a percent funded, and that's just a finding of where your current status is. It's used on a standard divisible table. So hypothetically, you've got a water heater. It lasts 10 years and costs $1,000. So that depreciates at, of course, $100 per year. So if it's three years old, you should have $300 set aside. If it's seven years old, you should have $700 set aside. And that shows you where your financial situation is. So hypothetically, if the water heater is seven years old and you have $700, great you're 100% fully funded. If you have $350, well, now you're 50% funded, which of course is a different number. And if you have less than that, say 175, well, now you're 25% funded. So again, most individuals that are buying a home understand that 100 is the best number, zero is the worst, and everything in between can be relative. But this is to show you where the association is at this particular point in time with their funding. And then most importantly, a funding plan and the civil code requires these go out 30 years so you can take a long-term look about how much money you're going to have to set aside each and every year over that 30-year period to meet your obligations. And we've got some screens that show that better. But those are the basic financial analysis that must be included in any reserve study in the state of California. So there's a number of subcomponents that tell you all about the property. So you see the component inventory is going to tell you what you have. It's going to be a listing of your items. The condition assessment will anticipate their condition in today's date. Uh, useful and remaining live estimations, the valuations, how much does it cost in today's dollars, the financial analysis, where are we at, what's our current status, and then, of course, the most important, that funding plan that's going to outline what's going to be necessary in order to maintain that facility. There's three levels of service in the industry. There's the full service, and as the name would imply, it includes everything. So they go out to the property, they identify the components, they quantify them, provide all the life expectations, the valuations, and produce a funding plan. Now we have an update with site visit. This is the one that's required after you've done a full study. If the full study is done correctly, it's only done once. After that, you just simply update the report. So you have the component inventory, you identify those components, you reevaluate their condition, provide them new life estimations, and produce a funding plan accordingly. And then they have what's called an update without a site visit, often referred to as a number three, a desk consult, or a financials only. So they don't have an inspector view the property and do a condition assessment. They just simply remove the elapsed time from the remaining life. So if it's been one or two years, they take that down. A component's been replaced. Well, then, of course, you reset that um, evaluation uh, based on the new life expectancy. 
You put in your current funding uh, situation, your, your beginning balance, how much you're contributing, and you roll that through the machine and it gives you what is a new funding plan. Now, <clears throat> the requirements for this is the association is required to have, or on its behalf, have conducted a visual inspection at least once every three years. So that second group in there, that update with a site visit, that's every three years. The board is to review this study annually, but in order to produce this next one, they're going to have to have it updated. They can do that in-house if they want. Some management companies do that. Of course, you can hire your reserve analyst to do that. So whatever mechanism you want, you're going to have to produce an updated funding plan each and every year because it's required for each fiscal year that they have a new and updated funding plan. The board is required to adopt that funding plan at an open meeting. All right, so this is your favorite. I know you didn't know that until you came here today, but this is your favorite document. This is the Assessment Reserve Funding Disclosure Summary, and this gets very specific, and it's designed to inform a consumer, either the homeowner or a prospective homeowner, of the situation. So you can see it's very detailed. Number one, you know, what's the current assessment? How much of that are going to reserves? Number two, are there any special assessments? And again, this is 30 years, so if it's multiple years out or what have you, yes, you have to detail. And then the other question is, all right, number three, based on all this information, are we going to have enough money? Yes or no? Well, if you say yes, okay, that's pretty good news. If you say no, uh-oh, that's a problem, right? Well, okay, well, that's what we've got number four. So if the answer to number three is no, well, then you have to tell us about what other assessments are going to be done. So it gets into very detailed information about what the association has, their current status, and it's within a short time frame. So it has a lot more accuracy than, say, 20 or 30 years out also required to disclose the funding plan. So the board can adopt any funding scenario they want. We're going to talk about that in a second. But whatever plan they adopt, they're required to give that to the membership. They're also required to disclose what's known as a full funding plan. So if they haven't developed a plan that at the end of the term, the 30 years, is resulting in a full funding, meaning 100%, then they're going to have to disclose that plan in addition to the plan that they choose, which, of course, doesn't get to that 30% scenario, or 100% scenario, or fully funded. Uh, this is also required. And by the way, you guys are the biggest contributor to the civil code. Yes, the real estate lobby has written most of the disclosure laws as it relates to the civil code. So again, I'll plug my email, scott at reservestudiesinc.com. You can get a copy of the Davis Sterling Act and see the laws that require this. So you'll see a few of these items are in 10 point bold type. Well, that's because the civil code requires it in 10 point bold type. And it's very specific information to inform the consumer. So you see that first group up there, it's the basic assumptions, the years that we're talking about, inflation rates, number of units, et cetera. That second group down there you see is the reserve contribution. So we're gonna talk about the total assessments in a second. This is just the amount we're setting aside. So in this scenario here, currently the association is setting around 5,800, about $100 per unit. And you see the recommendation is in bold because that is required. So what is the analysis after they've reviewed that set? Okay. 58.50 is okay, but it would be better off at 83.30, which is $143 per unit. Keep your calculators in there. That's $42.77 a unit. Now, that's also a 42% increase in the contribution rate. Good news, J, special assessment. You're not anticipating a special assessment through the term. So over a 30-year period, the good news, if you follow the funding plan recommended, you won't have a special assessment. Now, in the future, you see, we're going to increase it in another couple of years, that same 42%. I've got a slide that shows you that. So that gives you the basic of what's going on with just your reserve contribution. That next group down there is the total budget. So they say that they're spending about, or, uh, bringing in about $30,000 a month, and that works out to $521 per unit. So their current reserve contribution is 19.34%. Now, that's an important number because most of you know that FHA, VA, any federally uh, backed housing requires at least 10% of the income to be set aside to reserve. So in this case, it's already 19%. That's great. Good news. Then line in is, okay, well, what are we going to have to do to facilitate this recommendation? Remember, this guy is saying that we should take it from $100 to 143 Well, you're going to have to increase the total assessments by 8% in order to facilitate that $42.77 increase. Now, with that said, that does not include any of your operating budgets. We were told that that's your current operating budget. As we know, in this inflationary environment, there's a pretty good chance you're going to have to raise the assessments anywhere between 5 and 10% this fiscal year to cover the increase in their operating budgets, which have suffered from this inflation. Then this next number down here, this is the one that you guys plugged in so importantly. So this is the overage or deficit. 
So at this particular point in time, this association is $766,000 underwater, meaning they don't have as much money as they should have. Well, that works out to $13,209 per unit. And that is very specific because that's what the civil code says. It must show it on a per unit basis. Now, the reason that the real estate lobby wanted it in there is so that they could do their jobs, right? So let's say hypothetically, you're gonna sell a property. Um, and by the way, I, I probably should have said this up front. I'm a recovering realtor. So I, I haven't practiced in a long time, but I, I know the scenario. So if, if I remember correctly, you put somebody in your car, you drive them around for like six months, show them like 900 pieces of property. Uh, and then they finally decide on one and they make an offer and you haggle back and forth and you get offer and acceptance. And then you get all this disclosure documents. And in that disclosure documents, it says, hey, this wonderful property and sample education homeowners association of 58 units. Well, they're upside down by $13,209 per unit. Now, um, as you can see, I'm a young person, but I was old enough to remember before this most recent current buyer's market starts to approach back, 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 way back when there used to be buyer's markets. And of course, I'm old enough to remember a few years ago when it was very much a seller's market. So if you've got a seller's market, they're trying to, yeah, you go pound sand on that 13209, okay? If you're in a buyer's market, well, maybe you get some movement on that 13209. Well, the most important aspect is that that 13209 gets disclosed. So again, whatever market you're in and whatever circumstances, fine, you can work it into the transaction however you want, but it's important that it is disclosed. So that's why the real estate lobby wanted to make sure that very specific number was included. You see this next group down there, that's the cost to cover over the next five years. That's for the lending world. They like to do quick glances. So they would look at this and say, okay, $483,000. All right, what do they have in the bank today? Ooh, $169,000. Well, they're gonna have to start collecting some more money. Then this next group down, also required by civil code, also required in 10 point bold type. That is your current status. So this particular association as it sits today in this scenario is 18.15%. As you can tell, that's probably relatively low. We'll talk about levels in a second, but that's relatively low, you can all see. If they follow the recommendation of the analyst and increase that $42.77, at the end of this fiscal year, well, they'll have climbed from 18% to 23%. So we show you those percent funded or current status both at the beginning and at the end of the year. Um, despite our huge lobbying efforts, and, and by the way, um, we have a very powerful lobby. Um, the real estate, uh, in, excuse me, the reserve industry has uh, about 40 practitioners in the state of California. Um, and we have one of the largest lobbying groups. Uh, you might've heard of them. They're called the California Association of Realtors. Yeah, they lobby for these very specific laws that benefit real estate analysts. So the exceptions to having to have a reserve study is nothing that's actually true to the property that one, it doesn't have a industrial, excuse me, is an industrial or a, a commercial setup. So they are not required to follow the Davis Sturdy Act. For those of you that do sell commercial property, know that they have their own section of the civil code. I believe it's 6,500 that talks about their requirements. And it's much, much, much less than the Davis Sturdy Act, which of course is for homeowners. All right, some of the mathematics, because I know you guys came here to learn about math. That's that's why you came here. So we've got an outline here. It shows you the typical useful life, the estimated remaining life, the cost to replace that item, the annual cost, and the fully funded balance. So of course, the life expectancy is what you would expect. We've got a roof that lasts 15 years. It's estimated to be 10 years old or have five years remaining. The cost of that roof in today's dollars is $20,000. So the annual cost is nothing more than the estimated cost divided by the life expectancy, which in this scenario is 1333. Given that it's 10 years old, you would multiply that by 10 and it gives you $13,033, so $333. So at this point in time, you should have $13,333 set aside for your $20,000 roof. Not the whole 20,000 because you're not expected to need that for five more years. You see the water heater, the 10 and the five, $1,000. So of course, $100 a year, it's halfway through its life. So it should be 500 though. So you see at the bottom line totals there, the estimated cost in this scenario to replace all the components is $21,000. The fully funded balance, meaning at this point in time is only 13,833. Now, the important number to look at here is the annual cost at 1433, because if the association is setting aside 1433, well, then they're going to stay consistent and stay relatively well funded. If they fall behind that, well, of course, their percentage will fall. And of course, if they're collecting more than that, their percentage will cap up. So it's important to understand where the association is, this current balance, what 100% funded would be, and most importantly, what's necessary on an annual basis to keep up. Okay, so who can perform these? 
Well, civil code's kind of vague on that. So hypothetically, you can have a consumer a community manager. Not something we would recommend. I don't think most attorneys would recommend it because they're probably not qualified to do so entirely. Some that are probably don't have insurance. Um, well, what about Harry and Unit 3B? Again, the civil code doesn't require that you use a specific individual. It just says a reasonably competent, thorough, and diligent inspection. So if Harry in Unit 3B is capable of that, then okay. If Harry in Unit 3B is not capable, then no, you don't want him doing your reserve study. But most importantly, you want to make sure that it's a qualified individual that has insurance because Harry in Unit 3B, even if he were qualified, probably doesn't maintain insurance for a profession that he doesn't perform for money, right? So if he performed it for the one time for you guys, that's great. Yet, if there's something wrong with that, or God forbid, he hurts himself while he's on site, well, then now the associations could be left holding the bag, whether it be professional liability, general liability, workers' compensation. So our recommendation is don't let Harry and Unit 3B do anything in your community. Hire a professional that has the proper insurance. All right, so we go out to the property. There's the physical analysis. So you're going to anticipate what you're going to see. You're going to document it and put it into the report. And that's done through the component inventory. And you see it's generally done. Some do it systemically. Some will do it geographically. But you see it lists the items that the association has, gives you an approximate quantity that may be in unit numbers. It may be in lineal foot, square footage, square yards, et cetera. So whatever denominations they use. And then it shows you the estimated um, useful life and the estimated remaining life. And then, of course, the cost of that component and its annual depreciation. So this is generally a good quick look at what are your assets and it will summarize. Then you have the condition assessment. So a site visit. So the once every three year scenario, you'll have them estimate the life expectancies based on their evaluation. Often they'll include a photo. So if you're not familiar with an item, you can see what it looks like. All right, and now you have to go to the financial analysis. And as we talked about, this is required over a 30 year period. So the first thing to understand is the important is the component replacement schedule. So you see, you have the same inventory that we saw before. It's in the same order and you see it runs through mostly zeros because you're not replacing it every year. So you'll see it, it gets replaced, it goes to zero and then it gets replaced and it goes on. You'll see the later ones are more expensive. That's because inflation has been applied. So you see at the end, you have a bottom. So in year one, it's 21,000. Next year, it's zero. Next year, it's 123, 198. So while there's not 100% accuracy, uh, obviously, you know, we talked about those water heaters. We expect them to last 10 years. Well, of course, a water heater can fail before 10 years. Happens all the time. Of course, water heaters can last longer than 10 years. Happens all the time. But the chances are that the water heater fails in two or three years is pretty remote. And chances are that it's a 27-year-old water heater, pretty remote. So generally speaking, these estimates are going to be within a reasonable expectation. So when you see these bottom line numbers, it may not occur exactly in that year, but probably somewhere in that short-term frame frame. So when you look out at this, it's important to see that's really what you're saving for is this future. You know, people get, oh, I'm not putting away for somebody else's roof. Well, we're not asking you to. We're asking you to buy the roof that's on there today. You were there today. You used the roof. You should pay for today's use of the roof. So when we look out, every association, quite frankly, every building has these. And that's what we call the wow years, where they're the boom years. So you see in the early terms here, 21,000, okay, 123, 198. Yeah, that's a lot of money. 140, 101, yeah, it gets pretty big, but let's just go out a little, a little bit farther, a little bit farther, okay? Look out at 231. Yeah, 2031, we've got $569,000. So that's what we're telling a lot of people, these money. So yeah, you're gonna be spending these smaller amounts, this 100 to $200,000 multiple times, but eventually you're gonna get up to the one of these big years. And if you look at that component inventory, I'm sure that's gonna show plumbing, uh, roof, something substantial, falls into that year. And so that's what a lot of the savings is for, because what a reserve analyst does is they simply slide that financial analysis and they put in the component replacement cost. So you see in this line item here, the sample reserve, you see a uh, component cost in line item B, right? So the 21 and the zero and the 128. And if you look out 2031, oop, yep, that 569 is still there. It didn't go away. Yeah. So we're going to put in the component cost. So you see the way we have it here, you have your regular assessments, special assessments, good news, we're not recommending any, the interest income, so you have money in the bank, you're going to earn money on that, and then your component cost. Some years you buy a lot of components, some you that. So some years you're going to spend more money than you bring in, other years you bring in more money that you're going to spend, that's the natural association methodology. 
So you can see it gives you your cash balance at the beginning, at the end, the estimated liability, the amount you should have had that we've talked about, less the beginning balance. Remember, you have some money, and that gives you that $766,000 worth of negative equity, which again, divided by each unit gives you that 13209 that we spoke about in the moment. And so this shows you where you start, and then of course takes you out 30 years. So this is the recommended funding plan by the reserve analyst, as we've mentioned. The association is not obligated to um, adopt this, but they're gonna have to show this if the one that they adopt isn't a full funding plan. Um, Sabrina talked a little bit about this, but it's important to note because of reserve funding. So it's 20% against the total assessment, not the contribution rate, and 5% of the gross. So hypothetically speaking, you've got $90 a month in operating, you're contributing $10 to reserves, so the total assessments are $100. Well, the 20% in this scenario is $20, which is 200% of the contribution rate. So if you were falling behind in your assess, excuse me, in your reserve funding, you can increase the assessments by 20%. And of course, whatever is not needed in operating. So let's just say hypothetically, we got 5% this year. Well, you could increase it by 20% and put that other 15% into your reserve contribution. Same thing with that um, uh, uh, special assessment of 5% a year. It's a relatively small amount. Now, uh, I know Sabrina said that it should give some comfort and it should because there are limitations. However, 20% is a lot. So within five years, you double, right? You start at $100, then you go to 120, 144, 172, and boom, year five, you're at 212. You've doubled your assessments in a five-year period. Now, whether that's a wise decision or whether members in your community could absorb that is a whole nother question. But nonetheless, the civil code gives that board that authority that if they need to throttle it down and start collecting assessments to put money aside, they have the capabilities to do so. And then we get to the other side of the pendulum, and that is never raises dues vista. Um, anybody who's ever been to an association board meeting, oh, one or two has heard that. When I was on the board, I never raised the dues, right? And they're very proud of that. Um, and that's fine, but we want to show you the methodology and the calculations for that. So in this first year, we've got never raises dues vistas, and they had a good board. And so they said, you know what? Your regular assessments to pay all of your operating expenses, that needs to be $100 excuse me, $90. And then your reserve contribution is $10. That brings it to $100. So we're going to adopt that budget because we're a smart board. And then Mr. I never raised dues, he gets elected. Yeah, these people win elections sometimes. It's kind of crazy. So now, of course, we have inflation. So now our operating expenses, they increase to $92.40. And we collect $103. That'd be great. Then we could do our reserve contribution at $10.60, like the recommendation is. But remember, we adopted we never raised the dues. So our assessments remain the $100. Now, here's something that is true about homeowners assessments that I'm, I'm going to ask you guys to just think for a second. I want you to think, what happens in an HOA when you stop paying your landscaper? Okay, while you're thinking that over, uh, we talked about it earlier. What do you think happens in an HOA if you stop paying your insurance premium? Okay, and then uh, I think Sabrina might still be on the line. Um, what do you think happens if you stop paying your community manager? The same thing to all of them. They stop showing up and they cancel you. Yeah. So guess what? They pay that. Yeah. The associations like to have their yard mode and they like to keep their insurance because it's required by law. And they love Sabrina. She comes to work and she does all these wonderful things. So they're going to pay that. And so they pay the $92.40 to maintain their building. Now, of course, since they only collected $100, that only leaves them $8.60 to put into the reserves. So no longer are they putting the $10 that they used to, and certainly not the 1060 that was recommended, they're going backwards. And then of course, the next year, the same thing happens because inflation is an every year kind of thing. Been that way, oh, roughly 3000 years. So you see, they're collecting that same $100. They're still continuing to pay their operating expenses because those are very important at 94.40, now leaving $5.60 in for the reserves. So you can see it doesn't take but a few years of this methodology to fall behind. And crazy as it sounds, we have a number of associations that when they get to the point that they increase the assessments, it's because they've run out of room, right? Their operating expenses have inflated to the point that there's no more reserve contribution. So they have to raise assessments just to make the operating budget. And those are the associations that put themselves at risk for special assessment and are the ones that have the giant increases again. Most people should anticipate in normal times, two or 3% a year. In today's hyperinflation, you should expect five or 10% over the next couple of years, and then go back down to typical inflation. But it's going to be there each and every year. And if you don't maintain it, you're going to set yourself up for financial failure. 
Okay, so as we talked about, the civil code requires all this very specific information over a 30 year term. So whatever the board decides, the board gets and shows the membership. Now we're gonna go back to your favorite document. Because I know you guys have been talking about this. You've been thinking, why is this my favorite document? Um, because it helps. And uh, as I mentioned, I'm a recovering realtor. And, and this was true um, way, way back um, in the early 2000s when uh, real estate was going crazy. People, um, you know, if you remember at that time, there wasn't a lot of scrutiny applied to loans, right? Anybody with a pulse uh, could get a home loan. Um, you had to, you know, fog a mirror or cast a shadow. Either of those two qualified you for a home loan. So you got all these people who were getting these wonderful homes with not a lot of discretion. Um, and they would buy them. And then sometimes they would find out that the association was underfunded and they would get these special assessments, significant special assessments. And that was what we called a surprise. So the civil code calls them special assessments, which is, shows that it was written by an out of touch lawyer. It's really a surprise assessment. And as uh, Constance uh, mentioned, I think Sabrina would back us up on members do not like that. Members don't like that at all. And so what happens in those circumstances, what they used to do is they used to take their uh, their real estate agent to small claims court, you know, five, ten thousand dollar limit in the small claims. And because there's a high level of winning for uh, consumers in um, small claims court, they would often get it. Now, for the insurer, excuse me, the industry, the um, real estate industry, that's um, what we call nickel and dime, right? You get nickel and dime, five, ten thousand dollars, these claims. So they didn't like that. So they created this form. And they got it into the civil code. This is actually in the civil code. You see that number, that 5570? That's actually part of the davis Sturdy Act. So this very specific information about individual properties now takes the capability to go after your real estate agent away, right? You knew, right? It, how can you sue somebody for something you knew? So if you have one of these great documents inside your package, well, then you're going to be fine from your liability protection because how are they going to sue you? They knew there's a special assessment. It's noted in there. The assessments currently, the anticipated special assessments are the anticipated increase. It's all there. Now, the challenge is, of course, not every association gets a reserve study. Don't worry, I'm working on it outside. But we have a lot of associations that don't have reserve studies. And so you go into the transaction. And of course, the realtors are smart people. They have good lobbyists. They thought of that. There's a little check mark, right? Okay, so we know it's a good association. It's at a great school district. I really like this place, but it doesn't have a reserve study. And that's important financial information. But you know what? Because it's in that good school district, it's far to find a good three bedroom, two bath in this neighborhood. I'm going to go ahead and buy that blind. Okay, and then they find out later. Now, I can tell you what happens because I speak to literally hundreds of consumers every year. They are eventually going to find out. So why they signed that waiver to facilitate the transaction, that's great. But eventually, this information that would have been included in the assessment reserve funding disclosure summary, they find out about it. And they take it out on their realtors, right? They don't recommend them, right? You recommend things that you're happy with. So this is a surprise assessment that hits them out, but they're not. So what I tell people is, don't let the association do that to your future income stream, right? I, I'm assuming most of you anticipate getting repeat referrals from current clients. So... If you don't have this, you risk the same thing that everyone risks is, I don't know. You don't know what the financial condition of that association is. It doesn't have a reserve study. So yes, you get the liability protection by parking that check mark, but you're not gonna get the referrals and the good feelings from your consumers when they get surprised with a special assessment. So why are you letting an association who's breaking the law, remember these are required by law, so they're not following the law, you're gonna let them damage your future um, income stream? No make them get one of these. It's required by law. So if you have a seller and you're involved in a transaction, or if you have a buyer, tell them to tell the seller, have the seller notify their HOA that their home is for sale. They need a reserve study. And if they don't get one, they feel they're going to suffer significant financial damage. Because again, earlier we talked about that association was $13,000 underwater. Well, again, in a good buyer's market, there might be some movement on that. So if I don't know, I might just tell that person, you know what, I'm just going to knock $10,000 off the price because I don't know about the reserve study. So I want to protect myself. Well, now you've got a loss on behalf of your member. And I can assure you no association attorney wants to hear that. So if you put some pressure on the association by the sellers to say, hey, you're required to give me this document. I'm a member. I'm required by law to receive this on an annual basis. You're going to get it. So again, be reasonable, give them 30, maybe 60, 90 days or whatever you think is reasonable to get that information, but don't let the association get by with not providing the documentation that's necessary for your customers and importantly for you to get that referral network. Okay, so we're going to wrap up in a second, but I want to remind you of what we talked about at the beginning. So make an effort to ensure your clients have all the important documents. 
And as we talked about, it's expensive, but it's worth it to go get that complete document updated from the escrow. And then you want to make an effort to ensure your clients understand the uses of their community. So again, I don't suggest that you sit down and try and explain it and interpret it for them. Tell them to call CAI.org and there's hundreds of people on there that will be able to decipher that and explain it to them. Make an effort to understand the financial information. So again, they're going to get that information from the escrow officer or the buyer, the, excuse me, or the seller, whoever. Don't sit down with them and walk them through it. Give them CAI.org. I assure you, there's CPAs, reserve analysts, financial professionals who will walk them through that. And once they get a copy of the report, Call the individual that produced the report. You know, anybody who has produced that report is involved in CAI. They have a code of ethics that if somebody calls and asks questions, they're going to give them a little bit of their time, 10 or 15 minutes. Now, if somebody wants two hours to go through the entire financial history, there may be a fee applied to that. But if somebody calls and asks a few questions about their financial statements or their funding plans, I assure you the preparer of that report will answer their questions. And then, of course, last but not least, there's a lot of variance to the insurance requirements. So you want to make sure early on in the process when you're representing people in HOA, particularly on the buying side, that they've consulted with an agent who is familiar with common interest development, specializes in that area, and will be able to analyze the association's insurance policy and determine what that individual consumer will need to cover their liabilities. So with that, we are going to open it up to the references. You can see there all of our wonderful websites, but the one you need to remember is CAI. Excuse me, CAIOC.org. And with that, I will open it up to comments, questions, concerns, bitches, gripes, goals, dreams, aspirations. It's it's all open. And again, my email for those of you that want a PDF of the Davis Sterling Act is Scott at ReserveStudiesInc.com. We're also listed on the CAI website. So if you go to CAIOC.org, you can also find reserve studies on that. Um, if there are no questions, I'm going to hang around for a few more minutes. So that's fine. Otherwise, you guys have been great. Thank you very much for your participation. Uh, try and stay dry today. Oh, oh, here we go. Can you go over HOA 6 and HOA 3 again? Yes. Let me, let me roll that back. So yes. Um, they're going to be different because of the ownership. As we talked about in the very beginning with Constance, you have a condominium and you have a PUD. Those are the most common. As we talked about, there are some of the um, uh, cooperatives and stuff still out there, but most of the housing stock out there is going to fall either under condominium or PUD. Because of the responsibilities are significantly different, the policies will be different. So in a condominium, it's walls in. All I need to cover as an individual is whatever I put on my walls, my furniture, and my personal belongings. Whereas if I have a single family dwelling, I own the lot, well, that structure. So my HO3, I may not need to cover, of course, you know, the, the streets and I, I don't need to worry about all the common areas. But if that building burns down, I'm going to be responsible to replace it. So I have structural framing, which, of course, is different responsibility than an HO6. So they're going to vary differently based on the legal type of that entity and, of course, the amenities with each project. So if one has a pool and spa, it would have a different liability structure than one without those amenities. So as you get larger communities with a lot more amenities, it becomes more complex. Um, you know, we have equestrian centers uh, with gyms and, um, uh, you know, uh, pool spas, um, saunas, all kinds of amenities out there. Uh, and of course, there's just more liability with each of these issues. I hope that answers your question. If not, you can send me one directly at scott at reservestudiesinc.com and I'll be happy to respond.